Provence. So give a big hand to Holy Case and even Kastev to talk Eastern Europe. They're going to explain the hell out of it. Should we explain the hell out of this puppy? Talk, <laughs> talking about explaining, I was very recently told a very nice joke which fits. And there were two people, probably two of us, meeting uh, experts, one say to the other, do you understand what is going on? And the other said, okay, let's explain you. And the first said, listen, I also can explain. I'm asking, do you understand it? <laughs> <laughs> Well done. So um, may I start with a question? OK, um, this is sort of broadly about what's happened um, since. I'm wondering if you have, if there's a detail that for a time struck you not as all that significant that in retrospect now, from the period between 1989 and now, that seems to have gained in importance I don't know. Personally, I do believe that one of the most interesting things is that when people are saying what you have been thinking around 1989 and so on, this is, in fact, the question that you cannot answer. Because the situation was changing so fast that even certain things that you have been thinking on Monday, on Fridays, it's not that they were wrong. They were not on the agenda anymore. So you can remember what you have been doing. This is not a problem. You can basically even go and reconstruct what you felt. But strangely, for this 1989 as a moment, for me at least, there is no intellectual memory. Uh, one of the things that started in the 1990s, and I do believe it's uh, quite, uh, I do believe many people have been talking about this, I see it the same way. I know what we have not been thinking about. And one of the things that we have not been thinking about was economy. Uh, you can see a lot of people being discussed here and there. There was a lot of talk about the political system. There was a talk uh, about uh, moral and psychological dimensions. But suddenly, there was the idea that um, economy is the easiest thing to fix. Uh, and it came particularly, probably, uh, to the type of uh, uh, the circles I was part of. It came much, much later. Yeah, that strikes me as, I mean, because if I think of the details, I wasn't in Eastern Europe in 1989, but if I think of the details that I, that I didn't miss, but I didn't attribute the right, or uh, the significance that I do to them now, uh, it would be, you know, being in Hungary in 1995, for example, and, you know, hanging out with friends, and they were all sort of heading internationally. They were taking advantage of the open borders. They didn't have much money, but they had a lot of energy. They were young. They were excited. Um, and then sort of uh, in the off hours, I would go to flea markets and things, and I would see like an old woman selling her uh, nightgowns or her memory books, um, or I saw someone picking um, grass around the telephone box to feed to her chickens. And it's these things, or you know, I saw a tram driver, um, whom I saw pretty much every day because I took the same tram, who was uh, probably Roma, coming one day with his face smashed in. And uh, these are things that you know I remember, but they have taken on a much larger significance. The um, you know the ad hoc jazz concerts, the <laughs> um, the the you know the. Uh, costume parties that my friends organized on a shoestring, you know, the here read Levinas, here read, you know, Kertes, here, you know, watch this film. Oh, look, Wim Wenders, you know, that world of discovery was the thing that was uh, dominant at the time. And now when I think back on it, those other details seem to me to have been to, uh, they're, they're coming more into the foreground. Don't think particularly about this. This is a strange difference I have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, uh, uh, you, you go on a train. Uh, you go in on a train, 
And because there was kind of, uh, most of the economy was a barter economy. And when the train goes through a kind of a small station, you're going to see basically hundreds of people who are trying to sell you the things that is produced in their town. Because there was no money, so people have been paid in what they have been producing. So if you're producing glasses, there was a kind of a factory for glasses. You're going to see on the railway station uh, 100 people staying with glasses that they try to sell uh, to people who are going by the train. So from this point of view, going by train in Russia in 1990s is taking a lessons for the geography of the Russian economy. Basically, on every railway station, you know what is produced, probably with the exception of the military production, uh, but, <laughs> which was not sold on the railway station. It was on other places. Uh, 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 but, uh, but, but this was uh, this was very strong. And also, you can see also exactly this type of a crisis of a high culture. Uh, you go next to Metro, and you're going to see an old lady kind of decently dressed. So from this point of view, this is the per people who are on the street for the first time, selling one book or two books. So probably you're going to have Dostoevsky and she's staying just her, trying to sell you one copy of Dostoevsky. And this is somewhere between kind of selling and begging. And you have Dostoevsky because you want to communicate that you're not basically the professional beggar and so on. And, and this was in the mid 1990s. Uh, uh, it was very, 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 very strong. Uh, on the level of uh, pictures, which after that comes to you when certain things do not turn in the way you expect, some of these images are coming back and you try to see that probably, uh, yeah, I've not got something. I think it worked now. Um, I wanted to ask about power. Uh, because there, you know, every year I teach a course on the politics of violence, I show the clip of Ceausescu you know, in the crowd when his face changes, when he realizes that people are booing. And this is sort of a super iconic example of when something turns, but it's a little, you know, it's not just a little, it's it's way too simple, <laughs> right? Um, but um, I'm wondering, in, in especially in terms of the way that uh, the discussions have been going about how, you know, maybe we shouldn't use this word Wende for a lot of what took place or, you know, the the unvollständige revolution or you know the incomplete revolution or the one that didn't happen that should have happened and um i'm wondering if you have a sense of like a moment when you actually saw power go from one place to another like when you witness or, you know like or when you read about it, it didn't have to be sort of an eyewitness <laughs> uh stunning event but when you just knew or felt that power was mo on the move it, it, it's a great question because Romanian uh, events, this 10, 12 days in Romania, have been directly translated on the Bulgarian national television. And the person who have been translating from Romanian to Bulgarian, because he was simply translating what uh, the Romanian television was showing, uh, this became a career. He became the spokesperson for President Zhelev after this, just on the base of this. It was critically important because one of the interesting stories seen from the West, this is my feeling after that, uh, reading certain things and least talking to people, uh, all the events, Warsaw, Prague, Sofia, were very much connected. You're seeing them all the time. Uh, but when it happens in your own country, you're very much captured by what is happening in the country. And also people, of course, were watching television very much, but uh, the most important about 1990 was that you go to see television in order to see yourself there. Uh, 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 not in a vanity terms, because suddenly you have a people, for example, protesting in front of here and there, and you want to see is this covered. Not by accident, many of the protests have been the protests in front of the television. So the international context was perceived much better outside of Eastern Europe than inside Eastern Europe. Because people discovered kind of a making history of their own. And when you're making history, you stop to be so much interested in what the others are doing. Romania was different. Uh, because Romania was the one that brought kind of the fear, okay, the naked power, but also the naked power. Uh, and the problem of what is real and what is not. Uh, now people are talking about the fake news, about this, about that. But the first story about... Uh, 
what happened in Romania, was the suspicion, were they really people being killed, was there were people, of course, the conspiracy theory started proliferated, that there were people that have been already dead, uh, that have been put there. So this kind of a idea of reality that you cannot touch, you're totally dependent on television. This was the first kind of a historical revolution which was very much also the product of the television. And when you're asking about the power, the biggest question, and I do believe this question was so important that it ex explains a lot of things, particularly, to be honest, in the case of Russia, is it was so unexpected that first of all, while people do not believe it that is happening, what it exactly means, but secondly, the, mis the mystery. Why, for example, in Soviet Union, the police did not defend the communist system? Why the army did not do it? created this huge conspiracy mind, which you can see all over. Uh, the idea that it was not a revolution, that everything was a conspiracy, how it was possible that nuclear power is going to do this and that. And in the case of Bulgaria, this conspiracy mind takes a different form. The idea was that something was decided outside of the country anyway. That Gorbachev and Bush has disagreed, that Russian, uh, the Soviet ambassador and the American ambassador has been talking to each other. So nevertheless, that people have been on the street this kind of an agency was always questioned. To what extent, basically, we also wrote the script of our play, or to what extent we have been simply on the stage, but the script was written somewhere else. I'm glad you mentioned the script, because um, uh, you uh, told me a while ago that you used to uh, do postmodernist poetry. <laughs> back in the day. And I, I was wondering if you could give us a, a sort of Bildungsroman version of how one arrived at postmodernist poetry in the first place. And this was, I'm, I'm, I, th I think I recall correctly, in the early 1990s. And uh, where one, you know, like what, what it was coming from and what came out of it in your mind. No, it, it, it's a great question. There is a person who is better prepared than me to answer this. There is a real kind of Bulgarian poet here, uh, Georgi Gospodinov, so he can tell uh, the story better than me. But first of all, the good about uh, postmodern poetry is that much easier to write. Uh, so if you're eclectic enough, uh, you can look original. Uh, uh, but secondly, this was an interesting story because our generation was, in a certain way, a very privileged generation in several uh, in several respects. Uh, when we entered uh, uh, when we entered university, and this was, in my case, 1984. This was basically when Gorbachev to, came to power to Soviet Union, and compared to countries like. Poland or even Hungary or Czechoslovakia, the impact of, uh, uh, of the Soviet perestroika was very strong in Bulgaria, which was much closer politically to the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, there was a moment in which there was the most subscribers for some of uh, uh, the Soviet literary journals and others than for Bulgarian journals, because also part of uh, the, uh, the better educated part was uh, reading some Russian and speaking some Russian. Uh, I, I'm saying this because in a certain way you have this privilege entering in the moment when the system is opening. And this is the first argument that I want. Entering the moment when any system is opening is even more exciting than being in an open system. Because you basically experience the opening on a daily basis. Certain things that basically were not possible on Monday, basically taken for granted on Friday. Uh, secondly, in this type of period, also what is interesting is, and this is typically very much for small countries, is that you suddenly start to be interested in everything. Uh, before, you know how the life is going to look like. In a certain way, one of the interesting stories uh, about socialism was people remember social, the security, which was very much there. Social security, you know that you're not going to end up as unemployed, but also Part of the kind of a repressive, repressive type of the, the nature of the regime was that at 20, if you're intelligent enough, you can imagine how your life is going to look in the next 40 years. And this is not particularly excited, exciting, basically to know what is going to happen to you and so on. And then suddenly in the late 1980s, this changed. There was a kind of a, you don't know exactly what is going to happen but something could happen. 
And this is changing very much. The second thing that was very much privilege is that in the moment of change, the best biography that you can have is having no biography. Uh, basically, you have not lived long enough to do things that basically constrain you to say this or not to say that. Uh, even people who have a much more kind of a heroic bi biography, this is a problem uh, because uh, others don't like people that have behaved better than them. Uh, having no biography is great. Uh, you can invent yourself, you can do everything, and you have the opening of the space, particularly in the 1990s, in which suddenly you have hundred new magazines and publications, and then everybody is a writer, everybody is kind of wanted to make a point. And what is forgotten about this period, and when we have been working with the book with Stephen Holmes, we have been uh, rereading re some of the things from this period, you cannot imagine how serious the conversation was, even in place like Bulgaria that is not famous for being very serious. Uh, people were really interested in the basic questions. There was a political dimension, there was a moral dimension. You can see people basically try to understand how societies govern themselves, what it means this, what it means that. History was also very much present, comparing uh, with, for example, the, uh, the, the younger generation today. One thing uh, strikes me as very different. We were very much also, because of the literature particularly uh, connected to the Stalinist period uh, that was published uh, uh, back then, but you were very much kind of aware and trying to judge the people in the context in which they have been living. If you see, basically, the people who are in their 20s on the basis of what I'm reading, they treat everybody as their contemporary. Somebody who has been living in 18th century or 19th century when they're judging on people, they have the feeling that basically this is a classmate of yours. We were very much kind of a nuance to try to be sure that we're not basically trying to press people to do like this. When you're basically judging how some people behaved in 1937, for example, in the Soviet Union and so on and so on, you would try to make a very much strong nuances that did he betray some of his friends or simply did this and that? Uh, on this level, there was a kind of a very strong historical sense of context. I don't see it anymore. From this point of view, probably Fukuyama was right. It was the end of history. From the point of view, the history starts to matter as a historical context. Suddenly, we live in the same kind of a space. Yeah. Um... One of the things that comes up in connection with uh, the book that you and Stephen Holmes have written on imitation, this this book uh, I think is 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 fascinating. It produces some problems for thinking about causality, um, and especially for historians, because if imitation is possible, then domestic conditions, the social realm the economic pre-existing uh, pre uh, situation <laughs> seem way less relevant um, because you can transplant uh, an idea basically of, uh, of statecraft or governance um, without those conditions being present. And uh, we were just talking about uh, economy and, um, and you were talking about Bulgaria. I wonder if... Um, I'm, uh, I think this, there's something hopeful about um, context being not all determining <laughs> in the sense that it means that the problem that we exist in is not exclusively a material problem, it's also a thought problem, and that um, by means of certain political technologies, we can conceivably think our way out of it, not entirely, but it, at least partially. Uh, that's what this, uh, you know, letting go of uh, rigorous, you know, the old rigorous sense of causality does potentially in a positive way, is that it means that the, the power of interpretation <laughs> or of narrativization, if you will, is a real power that actually changes the world. Um, but uh, I think it's also nerve-wracking <laughs> in the sense that, you know, then, then what is the basis of real power if it can float like that on the basis of imitation? And if any technology is everyone's technology and um, that basically 
uh, we're already kind of slipping into a world where we think that <laughs> that everything is kind of in our heads, if you will, <laughs> um, uh, at least um, in the realm of um, discussions about partisanship, um, that, you know, two different people can see the world in vastly different ways and totally believe that the world uh, operates in according to their worldview in, in good faith, so to speak. Um, and that we've come to the point, a lot of us, where we sort of accept that that's the case, that there is, you know, that people believe what they say. And insofar as uh, they believe those things, there is a kind of reality that they're creating with those beliefs. And so how do you, uh, with respect to the matter of imitation, like what aspect of, uh, for lack of a better term, the real <laughs> or the material do you want to retain in discussing imitation? And what do you see as um, the prospects or limitations of imitation as a political technology? So just to, uh, uh, to introduce the basic idea. With, uh, uh, with Stephen Holmes, we have been very much interested to try to understand, is there something very specific for the last 30 years? And to what extent some of the illiberal backlash that we have seen today has something to do with this? And you are asking the question in the way that basically is going to help me to answer. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history author, uh, was a student of uh, Lipset, one of the major kind of a theories of the modernization theory when it comes uh, uh, to democracy. And if you're going to read people like Lipset or all this generation of people that have been read, uh, writing in 60s and 70s, they're going to tell you the following. In order for country to become a democracy, you need a certain level of uh, economic development. And there was even a calculation above what kind of a GDP per capita you need in order to consolidate democracy. Adam Przeworski basically uh, had a famous book on this. Uh, and secondly, they're going basically to see, this is very important for the modernization theory, a very strong economic type of determinism on level of the social development. They're not going to believe that you can achieve this and that at any moment. So they always believe that there is a certain trajectory, to be honest. The Western trajectory, this kind of very much uh, uh, based on the, the idea of the universal uh, nature of uh, uh, the Western development. I'm saying this because what happened in 1989 with the respect of the democracy theory is not very different than what happened in 1917 with the respect to Marxism. Marxism used to have also a very strong economic determinism in itself and that the idea that uh, Russia is going to become the first uh, communist state uh, was not coming naturally uh, to a kind of a traditional Marxist. They're too underdeveloped. They basically didn't have the working class that should do this. And you have the Leninist moment, in which basically Lenin said, it's about politics. It's the problem of the political will. The economic preconditions are not the ones that are going to develop this. And even as you know, they developed a special theory of the weakest link. Something like this happened. On the level, we have been conceptualizing uh, democracy. And the idea was, stop to be interested what is the GDP per capita, stop to be interested about certain level of urbanization and industrialization. And that I don't believe that it was totally false. What was happening was that we're living in a much more interconnected world and people are incredibly influenced of what is happening next to them. The most important for people like Fukuyama was that democracy and basically all these developments People are very much influenced by what is happening around them in the neighboring countries, also in the neighboring social groups. So from this point of view, this economic determinism, which was typical for the modernization theory, does not work in the way it worked. And I do believe that there was something to it. And all of us that have been basically uh, living these 30 years know. But also our book is arguing that in a certain way, the age of imitation uh, uh, could be one of the explanation for a different type of resentment that we are seeing. And uh, in the book, we have uh, four different stories for different chapters. Of course, we're interested in the East European story. And we do believe that in the case of Central and Eastern Europe, this was imitationist conversion. 
basically, this was the idea of normality. You're returning. The East wanted to be like the West. And this is not about West colonizing the East, which is now becoming popular in certain circles. The East was not pushed to do this. It was our choice. And it was our choice, and the key word was normality. And I do believe that we paid for this word. But the idea was we don't want to invent anything. No experiments. The word experiment was a dirty word in the 1990s, at least in the countries that I know. The idea was we're simply going to be like the West, and the European integration and the fact that you should adopt the legislation that have been not discussed with you uh, make this even kind of a stronger. Uh, Russia is a totally different case. There was a moment in which basically Russia was imitating simply to survive in a very hostile environment. And then suddenly, on the level of foreign policy, uh, the message coming from President Putin was, I'm going to imitate, but not your institutions. I'm going to imitate the real thing, the American foreign policy. And I'm going to imitate it in order to show you that you are not better than us. So from this point of view, starts to use imitation and the way to basically delegitimize the system itself. If you're going to read the declaration of the Russian president for the annexation of Crimea, you're going to see that there's whole paragraphs from the NATO declaration for the independence of Kosovo that have been inserted. Uh, everything was justified on the language of the human rights. And the idea is, OK, people were always asking uh, uh, me the questions, why, for example, uh, Russian president lied that there were no uh, Russian special forces in Crimea when it was clear that basically it was the problem of ours, uh, that the Western intelligence can name some of the people by name. And the story is, yes, but this is not lying. It's a provocation. Uh, you're doing this in order to be called liar. And then you're going to say liar like you. What about the, we the weapons for mass destruction in Iraq? And I do believe this was another form of imitation. And then comes the most interesting part of it, why they imitated the United States, people who voted for Donald Trump, decided that America <laughs> is the biggest victim and the biggest loser of the world that was imitating it. Uh, and I do believe this is an interesting story because the imitation allows us to see uh, uh, this uh, kind of a relations between the imitated and the imitator as the most important relationship in the last 30 years. How did it go to the idea of the reality? It goes interestingly enough, uh, because in a certain way, of course, the imitation created a crisis of identity. And if you're listening, for example, to Mr. Orban or uh, uh, to Mr. Kaczynski, some of their major messages we don't want to imitate anymore. And we don't want to imitate anymore, first, because we don't want to be imitators. Uh, as Mr. Orban said, now you're going to imitate us. We are the model. Uh, but secondly, because uh, uh, paradoxically, after 2009, there was a crisis of the model itself. What if we are not imitating the right thing? Uh, there was a study which I have, been, uh, I have read years ago about Bulgaria that uh, around 40% of the people who came to the railway station it was three or four minutes before their train. They uh, end up on the wrong train. They're running so much that they're jumping on the wrong train. I do believe this was also Central European kind of anxiety all the time, that because we're latecomers, we're running to the railway station in the last moment when the history train is going. Could it be that we have basically jumped on the wrong train? <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the matter of conversion because I wanted to talk about, I mean, we've, uh, we've addressed the transformations in some respect that have taken place in East Central Europe and Europe more broadly. I was wondering if um, we could talk a bit about the transformation that liberalism has undergone. Um, and here I find it fascinating that, and conservatism, I think we're in a we're existing in a time period when both liberalism and conservatism are in a state of incredible flux, and they're both are kind of representing positions that a few years ago would have seemed an anathema. I find it fascinating, for example, that conservatives seem intent on changing things, <laughs> and liberals seem intent on preserving. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, like um, if you if you look at the programs like of um, environmentalist movements or uh, architectural, um, you know, like city activists like Nedavimo Belgrad in Belgrade or Gezi in Turkey um, uh, or 
um, if you, <laughs> there's a great line in uh, the Star Wars film, um, uh, the last one there, where somebody is like heading um, to self-sacrifice in a big engine and is barreling towards this big engine to blow himself up in it. And his girlfriend basically cuts him off so that he can't destroy himself. And she said that in this era, we will be defined not by what we destroy, but by what we save. And I saw this as something, you know, I felt the zeitgeist go click. <laughs> and also there's this mini series in Spain, it's called uh, The Ministry of Time, where the premise of the mini miniseries is that there are these uh, employees of the Ministry of Time that go back in time in order to make sure that everything happens that already happened. And so just to keep the past the way it is so that it doesn't get messed with <laughs> and so that it leads to the present that we currently have, which I think, you know, it's these are sort of fascinating phenomena to me that, you know, it's almost like you could write a liberal manifesto as a conservative manifesto, conservative in the sense that it's trying to preserve something, to keep something intact, uh, to save something from like impen an impending threat. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, like in, in, in your view, how did, <laughs> how did this happen if indeed you see things also this way? The interesting story was that 1989, the very idea of the end of history in a certain way was the end of the future. Because before you have two universalist ideologies, both them rooted in the European Enlightenment, fighting how the future is going to look like. And all of them basically declared that the future belongs to them. Western liberals on one side and basically Soviet communism on the other. What happened in 1989, and from this point of view, if you basically go back uh, to Fukuyama, the end of history means the end of the future. Future has arrived. And this is quite important. From this point of view, this also explains some of the things that very much interest me and also they're, in the, uh, uh, they're very much in the book. When you believe that the West is the future of the East, something radically, profoundly important happens. Future stops to be ahead in time. Future is just next to you in space. If the future of Poland is Germany, this explains the fact that the first person, the first people who basically left Poland in order to go to study or work in Germany have been basically the liberals that have been waiting for 1989. I was always giving this example, but you cannot imagine Trotsky in 1917 getting a fellowship to study to Oxford because he believes that he is on the kind of a front line of history. There was nothing more ahead in history in his own ideology than Moscow, St. Petersburg in 1917. But if you're a kind of a, a velvet revolutionary in 1989, you yourself believe that what you're doing is what Habermas was calling back then the catch-up revolution. You basically are returning. You're not going ahead. You're coming back where you were. And this explains the fact that after every revolution, a lot of peoples are leaving the country that were in turmoil, but normally this is the defeated party that is leaving. It was the white Russians. It was the white French after 1789. After 1989, it was the winners who left first. Because every revolutionary wants to live in the future, and if the future of Poland is Germany, why to wait for Poland to become like Germany? You won't basically want to see how is the life there. So this major exodus of people, which in my view was very much a critical factor in uh, uh, Central and East European politics for the last 30 years, and we are now discovering its importance, was very much based on this change of future from something in time and something in space. But also it's very much changed the self-perception of liberalism. The problem of being imitated is that if everybody wants to imitate you, it means that you're perfect. And you're losing a self-critical perspective. Uh, this is like starting to work for export only. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, stop to be interested in your own societies, but also paradoxically, you stop to be interested in other societies. For example, you come to Bulgaria in the 1990s, and the only thing that you see is what Bulgaria is lacking. We don't have a rule of law, we don't have this, we don't have that, because you know, you have the feeling that you know where Bulgaria is going to be in 50 years, so from this point of view, it's not really interesting what is happening now. The only thing that is interesting is what you don't have yet. And 
this is the feeling that I do believe as a result of it, not simply liberalism, but Europe as a whole became totally nostalgic. There was a survey being done in all EU member states a year ago, which shows that 67% of Europeans believe that the life was better before. When is before? Difficult to define for different people, it was different things. And this cannot be explained simply by the aging of the European population. Uh, the percent was around 50 even people under their 30s. So then you have with this paradox that you have mentioned, if you, two, if you see the two most powerful movements now that can get people on the street, I mean the right wing populist on one side and basically Friday for Future and the environmental use, you're going to see that in a strange way both of them has an apocalyptic vision. One said what is going to be destroyed is going to be our way of life. So we are fighting, we are radical because we should stop time. The other is basically saying if nothing is going to change in the way basically we uh, treat the environment, it's not that our wave of life is going uh, to be destroyed, life is going to be destroyed. But this is also interesting to see how the conservatives and the progressives change their view of who speaks on behalf of those who are not born yet. Normally, the conservatives believe during the abortion debate that they are spokespersons of those who are not born are not going to be born. This was the major kind of a story. Then suddenly with the environmental debate, this is the progressive who said basically we're speaking on those who are not going to be born because you are making the biggest abortion possible. Basically, you are aborting the human life. And I do believe that all these changes are very much due to the fact that the idea of the future, at least the future understood as a project, the future that is valuable, the future that basically your kids are going to live in the world, which is better than yours, and you're envying all the time your kids that they're living in a be better world than yours, he has been kind of a change, and you have older generations who starts feeling sorry for their kids, that they're not going to have their life. I was, uh, I'm going to end up on this, but I remember there was around five or six years ago, a student's protests in France. And people were comparing with 1968, but it was just the opposite. In 1968, people on the streets were saying, I don't want to live like my parents. And here the message was, I do want to live like my parents, but they're not allowing me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned this because it raises the question of whether we need a future horizon and what that future horizon might look like. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about climate change over the past few days, and uh, one of the concerns I have with uh, with the way that climate change is discussed, and I don't know if there's another way to talk about it, is that it's impossible to imagine a better future. It's only possible to imagine a future that's less catastrophic than the one that we're going to get if we do nothing. And I wonder if there's, uh, if um, if this create, you know, if this potentially creates a vacuum that's, uh, you know, that some somebody is going to have to fill with the notion of a better future, at least, you know. I, well, okay, let, let's put it a different way. So one can, you know, there are segments of the of in in politics that can imagine a better future, but what they're increasingly doing is they're imagining it in zero sum terms. Uh, yeah, there, there, there's going to be a better future for me and my group. <laughs> but let's let's be perfectly clear in this environment, you know, like given that uh, we're playing now this massive zero sum climate game, you know, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And so let's just make sure that the better future adheres to us or to me rather than, you know, to the extent possible, rather than being, uh, you know, like there's no way for all of us to possibly enter this new future uh, such that we all benefit. And I think even when rhetorically, you know, there's a, there's a claim that, you know, we could potentially all benefit, there's this undercurrent also that, um, you know, that, uh, that the reality is stark. And I think there are two competing metaphors here. One is the spaceship, you know, we're all in this together. And, you know, like there's, if we, one of us goes, we all go, right? And then there's the lifeboat where we decide who gets in the boat and who doesn't get in the boat. And, um, and I think the politics uh, of, you know, the increasingly right-wing um, politics are of the lifeboat variety. And the question is, is there a kind of politics that can emerge from this moment with uh, that that doesn't have a future horizon, and maybe even this discussion is symptomatic in, to the extent that 
I, I think there's been a massive proliferation of commemorative events, like retrospective reflection on um, where we have been and where, you know, like what has happened in the intervening period. And a lot of that, you know, I just went to one on World War One last week, 1919. Um, and a lot of that is, uh, yes, uh, the, 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 cat the catastrophe that um, we were on the brink of in 1919 is similar to the catastrophe that we're on the brink of now. And now, you know, like we trace a narrative that's sort of like, oh, we missed everything. And, and it, it's, it's a narrative of decline effectively. And I just haven't been to one of these commemorative events where <laughs> there's anything like a triumphalist tone. And it, I think there's something maybe um, what one might call grown up about that, you know, like that it's, um, uh, we can face the fact that things are going to hell in a handbasket and, you know, this is mature. But by the same token, can that be the basis of politics? Can you can we enter into like a political future uh, thinking that there is no future? I'll try to, to join. And I'm trying to do generalization that because they're going to be so general that they're going to be wrong. So don't hate me about something that I'm not going to say because I'm not sure always that I rightly get the sense of this generation different than ours. But here is where my reading is. First, the young people now is a small cohort. And particularly in Eastern Europe, they do not have numbers. Uh, it's not simply that they don't have numbers because of low fertility rates, but also because of out-migration. And from this point of view, any comparisons with the 1968 should start with this basic distinction. 1968 was a huge generation. The average age in the United States in the year 1968 was 21 year. Basically, this was a society which looks much more like Africa today than Europe. Why I'm saying this? When you have this kind of a small numbers, the first thing that you start to have problem with is democracy itself. Because democracy is about numbers. Democracy is like a mathematical teacher that is counting all the time. And from this point of view, it's not by accident that you're going to see people on the streets, young people more and more, because this is the only way for them to get visible. There is something very radical and, to be, in my view, very impressive about uh, uh, this uh, environmental movement. And this is basically a strong claim that in order to save the world, you should change your life and particularly your lifestyle you should stop doing things. It's one thing that are we agreeing with what they want to stop to do or not, but it's a very strong claim on the individual behavior, which was not so typical for some of these collective <coughs> movements, for example, of 30s and 40s. And from this point of view, it goes much more to things that we basically normally relate to, for example, early Christianity and others. So the major change is that you should change yourself. You should not fly by plane, you should not eat uh, meat, you should, I don't know, in more radical version, you should not have children and so on. So from this point of view, this is not simply being on the street. On the other side, and I agree with you, I was always trying to compare this environmental movement of today with the anti-nuclear uh, movement of the 1970s, and this is a two important distinctions. Uh, people forget how apocalyptic the world was at certain points during the Cold War. I was reading recently about the number of the private bunkers that the Americans have been building themselves in the 1950s. This was, this was an industry. People really made a good money out of it. Uh, uh, so, so from this point of view, it was serious because it's not how people go on opinion polls. People were investing millions of dollars to build it. But about this type of a nuclear destruction, apocalypses, the idea was that we are all dying together. Probably we're even going to die in the three minutes difference. The world is going to be totally destroyed. The difference with the climate change is that if, if we're going to die together at some point, it's not going to be at the same time. Probably there are places that are going to be livable and places that are not going to be livable. There are people that basically can really save themselves and their kids for a longer time. And I do believe this is a kind of a story which makes the climate change uh, politics much more different and it's going to be much more difficult to come with the idea of the humanity as a whole than in the days of the nuclear disaster. And also with the anti-nuclear movement, it was enough to be successful, it was enough to stop politicians from doing something awful. 
Now it's not the same. You should push them to do something. If they're not going to change anything that they're doing, then you believe that the world is done. And I have the feeling that this is kind of a changes all the time. They go very much with the idea that future is threatening and you should decide what you're doing or not doing. Technology is quite interesting. I was reading uh, something that uh, stayed with me, uh, and this is about the reading habits of the American political elite versus the Silicon Valley people, what they're reading, I mean, what kind of books they're reading. And here's an interesting story. American politicians basically read history and biographies. And I do believe it's common. I do believe most of the politicians read. Good for Holly. They read history and biography. Uh, the, uh, what is typical for the Silicon Valley people, they're reading old science fiction, 20th century. And the most important, in my view, when I was trying to imagine about the Silicon Valley type of a thinking is they do not believe in improvement and reforms. The idea is you should start from the beginning, from somewhere else. We should start from the beginning in a different place. These people, what they're buying for themselves? Islands in which nobody lives. They want to go to Mars. They want to go to a place where the other part of humanity is not there. This is very different. In a certain way, paradoxically, this is politics without reforms and reformism. The very idea of a reformism, which was so important for anybody who is history focused, that things can change positively with small steps and so on. And to be honest, it was at the heart of liberalism of the Cold War period. Reform is good, revolution is uh, uh, dangerous. This is disappearing. So as on one side, you have people who simply, technology people, do not believe in the reforms. So if this is the case, you should decide what kind of mankind do you want. You don't like the mankind in the way it is. And then you can go for different mankinds. But this is the end of the idea of humanity as a whole. The idea of the humanity as a whole is that, OK, if it's Titanic, and even if you don't know who are the people on the other part of the ship, the best is that we can survive together. And now with your lifeboat story is the problem that you're probably even not going to be totally sorry uh, for people who are not going to survive because Titanic was not a great idea in general, and only the music is going to survive. Yeah. Well, I think we should open it up to questions. Um, After Titanic, no questions. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that ship has sailed, so to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to um, mention a, a bright spot in, in this post 89 times um, and ask you something about it, and that's Romanian films. Um, you, you mentioned that Romania was different in some way. Um, and there really has, there was, after about 2005, for about 10 years, one film after another that was uh, that perceptive, that was uh, original, that was critical of, uh, it was even that film 1208, uh, Bucharest, which is about the, what actually happened. It, did the revolution actually happen? one person's perception versus another. So I'm really curious, and I hope that people have seen those films, because there really are a whole new wave of great filmmakers that came out of them. Uh, I haven't seen, in the last few years, uh, uh, the same level of film from them as 10 years ago, but still uh, really extraordinary films. I, I just wonder how that came about. There are Romanian colleagues here who probably can explain better than me. But in the book, we're using one of those films, the graduation, uh, Munjo's film. Because uh, I do believe that uh, the, the, the story of the film is uh, the following. OK, let's tell you then two films. I'm also going to tell you about small Hungarian film, which, by the way, is going to explain you everything that you want to know, how the populist leaders perceive the role of Europe, it's not because of the, uh, the the movie director didn't do it for them, but I do believe it captured best. So let's start with the Hungarian film, which is called Sing. <coughs> and this is a, a, a short film. This is a story of a Hungarian schoolgirl who goes to a new school, and she's very excited going there because she likes singing, and this school is famous for their choir. So she wants basically to become part of the choir. And uh, the musical teacher agrees, and she's becoming part of the choir. But the choir uh, competition is coming. And the teacher goes to her and said, listen, you're not singing good enough. 
for the moment. So you're going to be part of the choir, but in order to kind of improve our chances to win, just open your mouth and don't think. So she agrees. Uh, but then uh, her friend learns about it and she's totally shocked. And when she starts talking to others, it appears that she's not the only one who is just opening her mouth. Uh, so the last uh, scene of the movie, which is a really beautiful scene, you have this choir competition and the choir is here and the musical teacher comes and she gives them the sign to start singing and then out of solidarity with the non-singing girls, everybody's just opening their mouths and they just start singing when the teacher has left. Uh, this is the way many of the people who basically are voting for the uh, populist parties in Central and Eastern Europe is going to tell you the history of the transition. The idea was we joined, we basically was asked only to open your mouth. Uh, by the way, President Chirac in 2003, simply uh, during the Iraqi war, never thought that he was writing content, but he basically said uh, the East Europeans uh, missed the momentum to shut up. Uh, so from this point of view, you have this moment and now we want to sing. Graduation is another movie which was very important for us to try to explain also in the book. One of the central contradiction uh, in the idea of the revolution of normality. And it comes from the story that the word normal has two different meanings. Normal is a norm, the ideal. But normal is also what is the most widespread. So from certain point of view, giving bribes in Bulgaria is not normal because this is not the norm. But on the other side, it's normal because most of the people are doing this. So how are you living with this kind of tensions between the two different meanings of normal? And here is the film of Munju Kams. This is a story of a girl uh, who is in the last year in school and she has got her SAT tests and so on and she's going to study, I do believe it was psychology in Cambridge. But the day before the last exam and she should have a high results on these exams. Uh, uh, somebody tried to rape her and nevertheless she was not raped, she was psychologically totally destabilized and she didn't have a good results. So her father, who is a doctor, uh, went into a corruption scheme. He decided to help some powerful person to have an organ that he was waiting for in order this person to help the daughter to have kind of her exams up. And this incredible story that in order basically to get into a normal world to Cambridge, you should be normal in the local sense. I do believe these kind of a contradictions were very strong in some of the East European arts. And it really comes at the end of the 1990s when people have been living with this type of stories. But this is also quite important because these tensions between the two meanings of normality can be resolved in two different ways. One is people basically changing what they're doing. So you stop giving bribes in order to get normal. The other is trying to normalize the West, saying they're also giving bribes but they're doing in a much more polite way. So we're not so different as they pretend. And I can see in Central and Eastern Europe a huge story now, not trying to normalize our own lives, but trying to normalize the West, saying, okay, what the Germans are going to lecture us on, go to diesel scandal and so on and so on. So, and this is very easy <laughs> because suddenly in both cases, the most problem is to say, I'm not different than you. I'm not worse than you. But this can have a two different strategy. One is, I'm changing myself, I want to be better. The other is to say, oh, it was wrong to believe that they are better. They're the same shit as we are. Um, thank you for all that. Um, I always enjoy listening to you. Um, this is a question that may not interest anyone else, but it, it is of a passionate interest to me. Will the loss of Great Britain make any serious change in Europe? <laughs> okay. uh, it's also interesting, but uh, uh, I, don't, I do believe uh, Holly can also say, does it make a difference for the United States? Because we should not forget also this. But I'm going to, uh, to touch on something that is not so much in the sphere of politics, but I do believe it's going to stay with us. For all these years, Britain, more than the United States, was a symbol of the wise elites. 
They could be evil, but they know what they're doing. And this was the story of Britain. This was the small island that was running the world and so on. And they were so smart. And I do believe one of the growing mistrust all over Europe in the capacity of our elites to achieve anything is very much based on what we saw in the United Kingdom. Uh, there was, I remember in one of the latest debates about Brexit, at some point there was a leak in the building of the British Parliament. And even this came like this. The story was everything is rotten, even if the British elites cannot be a common sense, if they cannot agree with this or that. So I do believe this major mistrust in the very essence of political elites is what is going to be the lastest effect of Britain, nevertheless of how it's going to end up. Suddenly people stopped believing that it works. Uh, that even Britain gets it. Because in Bulgaria particularly, probably the other East European countries, you have all this story about, oh, it always happened to us, what we're doing is exceptional, it can never happen in the United Kingdom. And there is nothing more demoralizing than understanding the things that you believe that can happen only here and never there can also happen there. So for me, this is the major effect. And of course, I do believe also in economic and political terms, Britain living is a huge issue, but this is going to stay nevertheless. Even if Britain is going to be back, people are always going to remember this chaos, confusion, people behaving like kids. Uh, uh, and also, there was a, also a beautiful article probably a year ago uh, uh, published in the Financial Times of somebody who was studying in Oxford in the 1980s at the same time when Boris Johnson and uh, Mike Gove and others have been there. And he said, to a certain extent, what you see basically in Britain today is the result of uh, the debating society of the Oxford Union and so on. So in a certain way, you wanted the highest level of the elites, the most elitist stuff. We talk about populism, but this is not populism that comes from kind of from below. Paradoxically, the way how to argue passionately about things that you don't understand at all, how be brilliant and totally lacking common sense, suddenly it appeared that this is not the problem uh, of just kind of a resentful people on the street. It turned out to be the problem of the elites. Unfortunately, that was the time we had, also due to the technical difficulties. However, we are waiting for everyone with coffee downstairs, and I think you may have the opportunity to still well, not a tag, but approach the speakers with your questions, whom I recognize, I forgot to duly introduce, I'm sorry. It didn't even occur to me that somebody might not yet be that enthusiastic of an admirer of them. So thanks uh, to Holly Case, historian of modern Europe and the author of the book, The Age of Questions, uh, for being here, and also Ivan Krestev, uh, who has uh, just published, I think two days ago, right? It was officially published his new book co-authored with Stephen Holmes, uh, The Light That Failed. You can read both of them in the headline on Eurozine right now. Both Holy Case's great article by the title The Great Substitution on how 1989 was substituted as year zero by 2008 by liberals. It's a very great one and it's a personal favorite of mine. You can also read our interview with Ivan in the headline, which is pretty recent because we had the time to ask him questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry for that. Thank you so much. And we have a couple of announcements too. So first up, of course, we are waiting for you guys with coffee and we would like to meet you at um, half past, so 11.30, here on the staircase to take the ceremonial group photo that we always take at Eurozine conferences because it's a sort of a second, no, well, not a second family, that's very, <laughs> that has a very bad connotation. So please come back for the group photo and hereby, officially, the public part of the program ends and the network fun begins. So we're waiting for you guys for bar camp after the group photo. Thank you to the speakers. Now. Sorry, mistake. Group photo is now.